Hey, welcome in Fearless community. If you are checking out Fearless Flipping, you are here because you wanna learn more about real estate investing. And you probably saw our title on this one with wholesaling and thought, that sounds like something I would love to do or I'd love to learn more about. And there's no better person to learn about wholesaling from than Matt Garabedian. He's right here in our backyard in Fresno, California. Matt is on pace and has a goal for 2019 to have 150 wholesale deals. If that doesn't blow your mind, I don't know what will, but you will see exactly how he's doing that. And you're going to get the tools, the, the techniques, the trades, anything that you need in this 30 minutes to learn how to start a wholesaling business or how to take it to the next level. And if at the end you're looking at this and you say, hey, I want to really just take it to the next level. I want to you know, be able to have some coaching or I want to be able to have someone there uh, with courses. That's exactly what Matt's got. Fieldsflipping.com forward slash Matt buys houses for the show notes and to learn more about what he's got going there. Let's not waste any more time. Let's teach you from Matt Garabedian's mouth how to wholesale. All right, we are back at it with Matt Garabedian, and if you missed the first episode, you have to, have to, have to go back. This guy right here is all about uh, motivation and celebrating wins and honestly investing yourself. That was the biggest thing I got away from that last uh, talk, but we need to talk about today one of my favorite things in real estate, which is wholesaling, and honestly, Matt, I just want to get started with the basics for our viewers and listeners that might be hearing about yeah. this term for the first time or really haven't put their head completely around it, what is wholesaling to you? Okay, so wholesaling, well, I'll break it down the best that I can. Let's just say that uh, you have three people in a, in a transaction. You have party A being the seller and party C being the cash buyer. I skip B to, to focus that because that's you, you're mm -hmm. B. Okay, so A, B, and C are doing a deal. Now, you as B are the wholesaler. And what that means is you're going to make offers to A, the homeowner, and try to get it under contract for less than market value. Mm -hmm. Okay? You find this motivated seller to sell you property below market value. You get it under contract under your name. Inside the real estate purchase agreement, you have what is an assignment con uh, clause. So it allows you to assign your piece of paper to Mr. C. Again, A, B, and C. Mr. C is just waiting here for you to give him a great deal. Mm -hmm. He's waiting for your phone call. Your job is to make a great deal between you and A, the home seller. So you are negotiating the best you can. You get the property under contract. In your contract, it shows that you have the right to assign it to anybody without any further permission or uh, signatures. So now you have what they call equitable interest. You have something that's valuable. You have a property that you have the right to purchase for below today's market value. Now you take that document and you approach Mr. C. Mr. C is the real estate investor in town that buys two, three, four, five houses every single month. He's a professional real estate buyer. He's not necessarily asking a bunch of questions on how the transaction should go, where can he get financing. Those are red flag questions. You want to deal with a real estate professional, someone that can literally walk into a house and buy five, six, seven minutes in it tell you yes or no. Those are the real estate buyers we want. So you find this buyer, you tell him, Look, Mr. C, I did a great job. I present off-market opportunities to well-qualified cash buyers. You're one of them. This is a hot deal. I could sell you this property for $125,000. Mm -hmm. Do you want it, yes or no? So then it's his job, to, you know, being the professional that he is, to see if whatever his strategy is, to, to fix it up, to sell it, to, to hold it as a rental, it's his job to analyze that particular deal and tell you if it's something that he would buy. Okay, let's pretend in this scenario he says, yes, $125,000 will work for me. Well, you presented that $125,000 deal to him knowing that you have a contract with Mr. A for $100,000. Okay, $100,000 with Mr. A, you take it to Mr. C and offer it to him for one twenty-five. dollars Mr. C agrees, so now you've just made twenty-five dollars 
without owning the house, without using any of your own money, without using your credit. You don't have to sign in on anything. You're just transferring your interest into the Mr. C's name, and in turn for you transferring interest into Mr. C's name, Mr. C's paying you $25,000 as a finder's fee. We call it a wholesale. Um, I, I, I think that it's, boils it down it's a little a bit. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? And so when you found out about this wholesale idea back in 2010, um, I'm sure just like me, who nine years later I find out about it, you know, I'm way behind the, the, uh, the cards here, but it wasn't just that like, oh my gosh. Yeah, my, no, my, uh, my yeah. Moment. yeah, can I share the story? Yeah, absolutely, or? please <laughs> okay. do. Um, so I'm driving and I put out a, a yellow campaign, a yellow letter campaign, I get a call. The guy's like, yeah, go drive by it. I drive by it, I look at it. I have no idea what I'm doing. And um, it's a house, it's, you know, it's, it's pretty beat up. And so at the time, one person or many people's advice at the time, I don't know if they still teach this, was when you're on the phone with a seller and uh, we're, now, now we're trying to get to like, okay, where do they need to be, right? right. What's the price, this and that. Um, you know, I was told at, at some point, if your offer doesn't make you feel uncomfortable, it's too high. Mm. So, you know, they literally want you to be like almost physically ill when you're telling them <laughs> how much you'd pay for the house. Now, I, I'm not saying this is good advice. I'm just right. saying this is advice that I received. And at the time, I thought, let, let me try it. So I'm sitting in front of the guy's house. I have no idea what to offer him. So I come up with this number of $16,000. He's like, mm, nah, I, I, I can't do that. Uh, can you do 25? Mm. I'm like, sure. So we get the contract signed. Uh, now I'm like, okay, I have a contract for 25 grand. Uh, I think it's a good deal. Let me, you know, I don't know for sure. So then I go, I, I start pulling comps on the MLS because okay. I had you know, access to it. And I found that uh, the same uh, type house, same square footage in the same neighborhood sold to a cash buyer um, not more than like, you know, 40 days ago. I'm like, I don't know who the buyer is because it's some LLC, but let me call the agent because that information's right there. So I called the agent. I'm like, hey, dude, uh, I got this property um, right down the street from the one you just sold. Would your buyer be interested in buying any more? And he's like, well, how much do you want for it? And I noticed that they sold theirs for 52. Okay. I'm like, 52? And he's like, don't tell anybody else about it. We'll have the money in escrow in a week. Wow. So I went from getting the contract for you know, 25 grand to one phone call, one shot, one kill, sold it for 52. You, you know, I was like, I made twenty-seven thousand dollars wow. my first wholesale. I, you know, was tripping out the whole time, thinking like, is the seller going to get mad? Is the buyer going to show up? Are they going to be mad? Are, is this real? Are they going to, you know? And it all came together, and I got this check, and I'm like, okay, if I'm an agent, I'm thinking with my agent cap, I'm like, oh, uh, let me let me put a sign in your front yard, and I, let's sell it for you know fifty grand. Well, okay. Um, Maybe he, he, didn't, he didn't have time to wait. Maybe he was worried about um, conditions or, you know, the, there was an illness in the family. So he wanted money really quickly, right? But, you know, if I didn't know about wholesaling, I would just turn around and, and called up another investor that, you know, I would just serve up another great deal to on the platter. Yeah. And what would I make on that? 1500 bucks. Yeah. So, you know... Um, it, it, you have to make a decision on what your mindset is. I mean, are you an investor or are you an agent? You know, are you there to, you know, to, to, to provide service in, re, in exchange for a commission? Or are you an investor, a principal, and you don't care about commissions. I, wanna, I only care about the deal. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of a different mindset. So in our first episode, you talked about door-to-door -door sales and getting those no's so that you can get to the yeses. Do you find that's the same thing here, especially when we're talking about getting houses below market value? Mm -hmm. um, how many no's versus yeses do you feel like you're getting? Well, on, on average, if, if our acquisition team is, is performing at the level that um, I need them to, they're, they're, they're closing a deal every 25th conversation mm. on average. So those are, but those are qualified leads that have come in. And then, you know, they have, and in, in, that's not just 25 calls, that's 25 prospects plus all the follow-ups in between, all the back and forth. So they need to have like, you know, 25 prospects to close one deal. So then you could reverse engineer that back, like how much it, do we really have to spend in order to get 25 prospects and, you know, what's the ratio and, and is there, you know, there's a lot of things that go into it. 
Uh, but if you're not if you're not paying for leads, you know, I mean, I've heard guys that are having to make you know thousands of cold calls mm. to get a deal. Wow. You know, uh, door knocking and cold calling are all great um, ways to to get a deal. But you know, I I don't know if there's a, a hey if you sit down and make a hundred calls that you're going to get a deal, but you're going to be very close. Right. In my experience, you know, you, you could, you know, you have to get through 50, 60, 70 no's before you can even start to think about getting a yes. And that's like the mental block people just can't seem to, to, to wrap their hands around. Or they do, they say they get it, and then when they get into the weeds and they're actually feeling that, then it, it's another story. Get that pushback, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so... If I'm sitting here thinking, man, wholesaling sounds awesome, I want to make $27,000 on one deal, where should I start? What is the number one thing that I need to do to get started in wholesaling? If they don't have any money? Let's say if they do have the money, and then second, if they don't. Um, If they do have the money and they're just brand new, I would say um, level up and and, and invest in some type of, of knowledge product, you know, a wholesale course or you know, uh, some, there's all kinds of information out there, right? I have a course. Yeah. And um, we're going to include that on the, the show notes so that people can go check it out. It's an awesome course. I, I just break, I, I break down the basics. I, I, I believe in fundamentals just like in anything. So if you're not doing the fundamentals, then you could forget about scaling or even getting to a consistent business. You know, you have to do your fundamentals. And um, the first thing I would do is pull a list and cold, skip trace and cold call if, if, if you're low on budget. So you, you have to um, be proactive and not expect um, people are going to come to you initially. Mm-hmm. So you have to reach out. So that's the most effective way that I've seen is and, and, the, and the most affordable. Um, and then you've got driving for dollars. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you have to also be proactive with that. Right. And you've got to probably build, I'd imagine, uh, 200 houses to even get a prospect. Yeah. So now if I have the money and I want to streamline this a little bit more, is direct mail the way to go? It just depends on what your expectation is, right? So, you know, I know um, in some areas I have to spend $3,500 to get a deal. In some areas I have to spend eight or 9000 Wow. So, you know, you could get into an area and think that you're actually marketing and, and doing, you know, you know, a service to yourself. But if you're, you don't even know where the threshold is to get a deal. Like you're just burning money. Mm-hmm. So that's why you, you may think you can get all the advice that you can find online, but l- literally a local mentor, you know, that you're willing to go and, 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 and pay them for their time or actually take your business seriously and want to learn how to do this business, they're going to cut out all those mistakes. Like I know how much we need to spend in this county. I know what the response rates are going to be on on this particular mail drop. Hey, we're having you know uh, issues with leads. Okay, I could flip the switch and leads start pouring in. Like this is stuff that you don't learn online. This is stuff that you learn over trial and error because we're actually doing the business. Mm-hmm. And then now came to a point where like, hey, you know, we could give back and we want to help out, but you know, everybody comes in and expects to make a million dollars. You know, it just doesn't work like that. Like you have to do the work. Mm-hmm. And then once you're able to do the work and you have pieces of the business and you understand them, then you could start replacing yourself out of the out of the you know the business. Absolutely. But I don't want to get it complicated for you guys. So like the the, the basics, guys, is you got to focus on this. This is the biggest takeaway: money making activities. Mm-hmm. Don't get caught up in anything that is not going to produce your next check in the quickest amount of time. So money making activities: cold calling, networking, driving for dollars putting out bandit signs, okay, networking with other cash buyers, um, networking with real estate agents, anything, you, anybody you could do to let, let them know what you do, those are money-making activities, specifically like cold calling your, your face off. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Every, it, it sucks. I'm not going to sit here and tell you it's, it's, you know, it's fun. It's a mental grind. Mm. But um, everybody that's been successful in this business has done it. You know, and that's just the the barrier of entry. Yep. 
So if you can't do the the baseline, then dude, get out of the business. Yeah. You're you're I'm and and I'm just being real with you because um, you don't just show up and deals fall in your lap. Like you have to go knock on doors, you have to pound the pavement, you have to get beat up, you have to lose, you have to get burnt. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, I'm just letting you know this is fearless. So you have to be fearless of anything yeah. that and it's gonna come. So if you're not screwing up, if you're not taking actions, you're not doing anything. Like you're calling yourself an investor. Yep. You can't call yourself an investor until you've closed deals, you've done deals, you've had an escrow, you've closed an escrow. Now, like you've owned some property, great. Okay, you're an investor. Other than that, like you're, you're learning, and then only and, and and you should have that mentality. I'm going in to make mistakes. Absolutely. That's the only way you're going to learn. You know, if you're too scared to jump in, then this is not for you. Action and trial and error. That's that's what I take away from that, and that's awesome. So let's say I've gotten that plan. I'm taking massive action. Um, I've, I've found the way for me that I am, you know, whether it's cold calling, skip tracing, you know, the, the driving for dollars, whatever it is, I get that first lead and, you know, you just talked to us about your first lead and getting to that house and, you know, making $27,000 and you really didn't at that point know what you were doing. But right. going back to that, if, if you were to teach someone, hey, you're taking that first call, it's a hot prospect, here's how you take them from point A to contract. Um, you know, what does that process look like, especially if we're going to get them under market value? Yeah, the biggest, I think the biggest peop thing people overlook, number one, is when you're on the phone, um, you have to imagine um, that this person obviously doesn't know you. And the only thing that you have going for you is your energy and your enthusiasm and your confidence. So, well, Matt, I haven't done a deal. How can I be confident? Well, work on your, on your script. Work on your approach. Work on your tonality. Um, I, I'm consistently able to like show my team when they come and tell me like the leads are weak or this or that. Like probably, you know, you can ask the guys in my office. Like I pick up the phone very rarely, and when I do, I all, almost always come out with a deal mm. because I'm confident. You know, I know that where the end game is, right? In terms of how can I provide the right value? I have to write, ask the right questions. How can I develop a rapport with this person so that they know they'll end up knowing me, liking me, and trusting me, you know, within the matter of 15 or 20 minutes on the phone? I don't even care about the house. Yeah. The last thing I'm talking about is how, how many square feet. Like, dude, I know you're an amateur when you, when you call me and say, how many square feet do you have? You know, um, you, know you know that. It's in front of you. Like, do your due diligence. If you need to confirm something, confirm. How about asking them, you know, what's going on with your you know, with your particular circumstance. Is there anything that, you know, prompted you to give us a call today? I know you probably get a lot of postcards. What prompted you to, to take time out of your day to share with us what's going on? You know, we're, we don't buy houses in every situation. We are very specific, almost like a, you know, a unique solution to, you know, a certain amount of people. My job is to determine if we're a good fit. You know, and so in order for me to do that, I'd like to know a little bit more about, you know, what your situation is, what your goals. When's the last time you asked somebody what your goals are when they're selling a house? Mm. You know, it's just a different approach because these people get, you know, uh, I'm a cash buyer. I could close in seven days and blah, blah, blah. Like, no one cares. Like, you're just vomiting on someone's feet. You don't even know what benefits they want. Sell me this pen. It's blue. It writes well. <laughs> <laughs> it's blue. My money's green. Uh, <laughs> uh, so the point is, guys, like, don't be so, like, canned. Don't be a robot. Th these are people. And your goal is to create a different experience for them, really. Because, you know, you can imagine, um, we've all gotten cold calls, right? Like, you know, some of them just are, you know, just outright terrible. Don't mm. be that guy. You know, it's, it's the one that you could tell that are, they're nervous, they're scripted, they, they, don't, they don't have the goal in sight, right? I know that, I, you know, there's a, there's a purpose to the conversation. Because I've done them so many times that I know that, hey, I need to build rapport. I, I need to ask them some stuff about themselves personally before I even get into their personal affairs. And then I want to ask for permission along the way. Mm. I want to ask for permission that is, is what I'm saying to you make sense. I want to get a yes. Absolutely. Um, you know, next point is, well, let me explain to you, are there any specific questions that you have for me? You know, I'm trying to draw out of them. Like, oh, like tell me about, you know, this experience or when did you buy the house? You know, how many tenants have you had? Um, you know, do you have any other plans? Are you still actively investing in real estate? Do you travel much? Yeah. 
I mean, it's 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 just a it's just it's, a way of being a human. That's it's all so good. I I even you know with us being investors too, you probably get calls from other investors. I get them every once in a while, and I'm like, you know. I feel like I'm just listening to someone who's reading off a script. I don't. Yeah. I don't want to meet someone who's reading off a script. Yeah, I mean that, and 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 imagine the the person on the other end getting that call. Like, yeah. they're gonna hang up on you yeah. because you know there, there's nothing different about what everyone else is doing. Yeah. So, which is a good point. Jason Pritchard talks about this being a professional or well, a sales professional right. and leaving people with that experience of like, hey, that was different. That wasn't a used car salesman experience. That was like, I want to do business with that guy even if I didn't right now. Exactly. Um, so from the wholesaling side of Mr. A that you just talked about, being different, getting to know them, showing them that you care. Now, how about Mr. C who is the cash buyer? How do I make myself different as a wholesaler to make sure that when my emails, my deals come through to that potential cash buyer, that they're not like, oh, it's just another Kyle deal, but they're like, oh, great, it's another Kyle deal. Yeah, good question. Um, we, you, you, we go from the frame of mind of we create off-market opportunities. So it goes back to, like, I'm not an order taker. Like, I don't have buyers that call me and say, Matt, I need this, this, and this, and then I go out and find it for them. Mm. Like, I, hey, I, I bring off-market opportunities. Here's, you know, it's very exclusive. Um, you know, some people get, you know, uh, access to them uh, before they're even on a list. So um, in order for you to, to create, like, a, a, a buyer's list that, you know, pays attention, that opens your emails, that are making offers, I think, you know, number one, uh, time you know, you, you get a track record and, you know, some credibility like, okay, if this company's sending out a deal, I should probably pay attention to it because there's probably some room to mm -hmm. profit. Um, so time, obviously, but, you know, uh, you know, do your due diligence. I mean, mm -hmm. make sure, like, I know my buyers. I, you know, f a lot of you guys out there that are volume buyers, I know what you buy. I know what, you know, what you'll pay. I know what returns you're looking for. I know what areas you like. So if we get a property, like, okay, this goes to this guy. This goes to, and I've developed relationships with them that I, I, I've trained my guys up front. Hey, you know, you've got you've to build these offers with the end guy in mind because we're not taking them down right now. And so I prefer to wholesale it. So we have to make sure that we're getting it at a spread where, you know, it's a no-brainer for him. Like, we sell our deals with, you know, an email, mm -hmm. you know, many times. And, it, and, and these are repeat buyers that I you know, talked about their professional buyers. We don't have to hold their hand. They're not, we're not calling them and saying, where's your wire? You know, or they're not, hey, you know, we sent an appointment and you, and you didn't show up. Or, you know, you, you, you disturbed the tenant when we, we, we didn't ask, you know, we asked you not to do that. Right. There, there, there's things that you learn along the way that, hey, um, this guy's only, I can only make a 10 grand assignment fee. Um, and I know he closes, but this guy over here is willing to pay 15, but I've never done a deal with him. Mm -hmm. I've done, I've gone with the $15,000 guy and I ended up pulling my hair out through the process because, you know, there's a reason they offered five more because they really didn't know what they were doing. They didn't really have the money set up like they said they did. And it causes problems. It causes chaos. So uh, you identify your buyers and, and know who, you know, who they are. Don't go to them and say, uh, I'm a new wholesaler in the area and I'm looking for, uh, what, what type of deals do you buy? It's a terrible question. Mm. It's a terrible question. How about, you know, you, you, you get a little bit ahead of the game, pull, you know, the top five LLCs and see where they're buying. Pick out the zip code. Now you're looking at what they're paying for these houses. So instead of asking that, you know, rookie question of what type of houses do you buy, hey, Mr. Investor, I know that you bought in a house over here um, in this neighborhood and uh, a couple more around the corner. Uh, I got a couple that um, I'm, I'm looking to, to pick up. Um, are you still buying in that area? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like, you know, that's how, that's how you approach a, a, a buyer. Well, and that's really good information because – the question that you just said is a terrible question. I feel like a lot of new people are being told ask that question. I think it's stupid. Yeah. And so going back to that first episode where you said we're not in the real estate business, we're in the marketing business. And so the end game of knowing your marketing to these types of people, uh, you got to do that research and you got to not sound like the idiot on the phone that's like, hey, I'm new and I'm, you know, you, you got to go do that on your own because these guys are producers. They're out there, they're looking for deals, and they yeah. don't want to take five-minute, waste-their-time phone calls, right? Yeah, what are they going to tell you? A three-bedroom, yeah. two-bath, 1,100-square-foot house yeah. between this price point and this? Like, 
I mean, you're not going to find that deal anyway because you're asking the wrong questions. Right. So you know, learn. There's a lot of power in questions, guys. So don't don't uh, discount that. You know, if you ask the right questions, you'll get better answers. So think about that. What is the potential of someone who takes this business serious to where they're at today of just learning how they can be Mr. B between Mr. A and Mr. C? What's the potential over time, over years of what this can turn in for them? Well, I mean, the way that I've, it just depends on, it goes back to what do you want, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm still in the process of answering that question. So like, it, it's, it's, a, it's a moving target and that's, and that's okay. But for me, um, it was amazing for me to like leave um, for three weeks with my family and have the business like uh, running and, and, and profiting and closing deals. Um, I've been working hard towards that uh, goal over the last few years, but I had kind of an end in sight, right? So it's the same question for you. Like, what's your end goal? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what I'm doing or what Kyle's doing or what any other investors, what, what their game plan is. Um, what's, what, what serves you? How can you structure your business to serve your lifestyle? Does that make sense? Absolutely. That's how I think about it. And so now it's like, okay, I, um, everything is about, it talks about, oh, I want to build cash flow, cash flow, cash flow, right? Well, there's other ways to build cash flow instead of going to buy a fourplex or do, those are great ways. But I also had the advantage of being on the other side and seeing what those numbers really look like because I built and sold a property management business. So at one point we were managing like 600 doors. So I would see what the real operational expenses are on these apartment complex, mm -hmm. what these guys were actually netting and the prices that they paid for it. So, you know, and, and how much, in, you know, management intensive is, how much brain capacity it takes, how much time it takes from you. So that's a long game. That's a different game. That's an active, passive game. So you have to be actively managing it or actively, actively managing your manager. Mm. So it's another job. And that's a long game, and it's not going to produce the type of cash flow you want for 15, 25, 30 years, which is cool. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, well, I also want to have, I don't want to be 65, 7 years old and saying, well, you know, I finally can take that trip because I've built my rental portfolio all these years. I think you're missing the point. You know, y y why not have both? Absolutely. You know, so you could create a business of cash flow. So I have created my business to run where the marketing is going out, the deals are coming in, the, ha the phone calls are handled, the appointments are being made, Those the paperwork are, are done, and I'm just like kind of overseeing it. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's somewhat passive to a degree. I mean, I'm still kind of present and I'm still leading my company and making decisions. So I'll say it's active passive. But I've built this passive to be predictable, right? So now I have the choice to say, okay, I want to invest this into you know, other assets, other vehicles. So I do some notes. I buy some rentals, right? Uh, I invest in myself. I take money that I make, reinvest it in myself because I feel like I'm growing and then I could help others grow and level them up. So, you know, you can go into, okay, um, you know, I want to create a passive business through, uh, I want to uh, do a, um, you know, a, a membership site or a, or a coaching or a, a product or a service. I want to start a title company. It, there's many paths to freedom. Mm -hmm. It doesn't always have to be the single family Burr method, right? right? That's, a, that's, that's a good method, but you know, be careful because you're going to stack up 35, 40, 50, 60 doors and you're going to have management problems. You're going to have cash flow problems. You're going to have months where your vacancy goes you know, below what is expected. Your expenses on your repairs are going to go out of whack. So you know, just be sure that you understand what you're navigating there mm -hmm. you know, nice. and, and don't feel like you need to build it you know, now. Well, that's what's so good about real estate is even though we're talking about wholesaling and building systems to build a business, there's so many opportunities here in real estate. So the one thing I want to just really encourage to our fearless community is to make sure to go to the show notes. If you want to get started in wholesaling, check out the course that Matt's got. And we've got those show notes at fearlessflipping.com forward slash Matt buys houses. Uh, before we wrap up here, Matt, I just need to um, say, you know, first of all, thank you. This has been amazing information. People who are wanting to get started in wholesaling are going to get amazing info out of this. They're going to go check out your, your course on the show notes. But is there one thing, one, um, you know, just 
gold nugget that if someone is going to jump into wholesaling, that they need to keep in mind jumping into that? And I, I know I just got yeah, through that question. Sure, on no, you no, it's a good, no, no, uh, there's no plan B. Mm. So burn the boats. You're not coming back, right? You, you, you got to make sure that the reason you're doing this is, is deeper than money. Yes, we have to provide, we want to earn money, but um, that's not going to get you um, to the goals that you want. Mm. You, you're doing this because you, you're tired of the nine to five. You're not going back to the cubicle. You're not being told when and where you have to be. You're not putting limitations. You're not putting income limitations. You're not putting mindset limitations. What about when you, 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 know, you tell your kids, if you have kids, son, you can be anything you want. And what, what if they say, well, how come you're not, dad? Wow. What if we get to that wow. age when they, when you tell them you could be anything you want and they look at you like, yeah, dad, what'd you do? Mm. You know, I want my kids to see like I'm constantly being a better version of myself. I, I want to be a better dad, a better husband and a be better father, you know, I, you know, serve the Lord and, you know, just be true, be, be true to your, to your, uh, truth, wow. you know, and, and that, and, and that's all the, mo all the motivation you need. And this stuff, dude, I tell everybody it's easy. It, this is the hard part. Yep. If you can get a, 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 out of your own way, wholesaling, dude, come on. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> I love it. This, if you guys aren't on fire about going out and trying wholesaling or just getting into this business after listening to what Matt has to say, uh, I don't think you're ready to conquer real estate investing. But if you are, get onto the show notes. Go check out the course. Get everything into action. There is no plan B. Go burn the boats, and soon you will be conquering real estate investing. Thank you so much, Matt. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you, buddy. One more time, fearlessflipping.com forward slash Matt Buys Houses. If you want to check out those courses, check out what Matt's got going on, I, I got to really encourage you on this one. If nothing else, you got to do it just for your education. The more you know about wholesaling, the more that it's going to educate you to be that different person in your market, that educated person in your market. Matt has talked so much in the last couple episodes about being a professional, not being an amateur. And the more that you can educate yourself, invest in yourself, invest in your business, the more that you will be different in your market. So make sure to go check that out at fearlessflipping.com forward slash Matt Buys Houses. Take Matt's advice. Burn the boat. There is no plan B. And soon you will be conquering real estate investing.